Welcome to the Man Whore Podcast. What's up, super studs and poly pervs, ethical sluts and happy whores? This is Billy Persida, and you are listening to the Man Whore Podcast. Welcome to the show if you're new. Welcome back if you're not. I'm your host, comedian Billy Persida. Normally on this podcast, I talk to women I've hooked up with every week about sex, dating, sexuality, gender, love, and the occasional butt stuff. But this week, I've got a couple of very special guests. Yes, I ha- oh, I'm so excited. I have on the co-authors of The Ethical Slut. Yeah, that book. The, bu- the book, right? The book from where I stole my definition of the word slut. Yes, I have on Janet Hardy and Dossie Easton, and I can't wait to introduce you to them in a bit. But first, I got some show dates, people. Show dates. Yes, August 11th, I am down on 14th Street at Bunga's Den at 8 p.m. That is a uh, free comedy show. Then, Connecticut. You listening, Connecticut? Over the sound of playing lacrosse and and sipping red wine. August 14th, I'm going to be at Mohegan Sun. Uh, at their comedy club, it's called Comics with an X. For information on those shows and more, head on over to manhorpod.com slash comedy. And while you're over at manhorpod.com, get on the mailing list, people. I'm serious now. I just sent out this week uh, my first monthly newsletter funded by my supporters on Patreon. Uh, this month's newsletter included a very steamy story, an exciting life update about me, and some other information you may need to know. So again, head on over to manwarpod.com and get on that mailing list. And again, include a zip code. You got Include a zip code, people, because that way I know where you are. Not in like an NSA kind of way, just kind of like if I know I've got a large cluster of folks in Iowa... I'll go book a fucking comedy show in Iowa, you know? So head on over and do that. Uh, How am I doing? Had a Hacienda weekend. That was fun. The theme was church. So, uh, you know, a lot of sexy schoolgirls, some pervy priests. A couple dudes went Mormon. I was really impressed. My mind never went to Mormon. So that was was excellent. Of course, P and I were uh, my, my lady, P. She, uh, we were the first ones fucking on the, I guess you'd call it the dance floor, the fuck floor, whatever. We, we, we didn't exactly waste much time mingling. We had to volunteer for two hours at midnight. So we were like, well, if we're getting there at like nine 30, we should probably get started. So that way we've done some stuff by the time we have to start our shift. Some dude came up to me. He's like. Uh, later that night, he goes, hey, man, you, great job. I'm like, well, what? He's like, you put on a real good show, dude. And, and that was a little weird because uh, I've never had a guy, a man come up to me to compliment me on like my f- fucking style. I mean, because I, I wouldn't exactly call it a style. I, I just call it like me nervously trying to maintain an erection in public. But I was like, no, th- thanks, dude. Appreciate it. That's nice of you for for watching me fuck long enough to have an opinion on it. It was kind of crazy. They did like a, uh, they did like a performing arts piece. So I'm watching like my metamor is dressed as a, uh, an Egyptian slave driver, like a biblical Egyptian slave driver. And, and she's whipping another girl who's supposed to be a, a Hebrew slave. And, but the slave, she's enjoying the whipping too much. But then Moses shows up and like saves her by fingering her till she squirts. And then there was a sexy Jesus who got tied to a transgender cross. And, you know, that's kind of around the time I left. Because um, I did not feel safe. And I don't mean not safe the way like wimpy college kids say. It. I meant not safe as in if there is a God, a lightning boat was uh, heading for that house pretty quickly. It's got to be like a close three-way race between what's the more sinful location, Sodom, Gomorrah, or the Hacienda house. And uh, I'm goddamn proud of that. <laughs> I want to I want to uh, give a shout out, by the way, to S and J. I had a couple listeners who were there. Uh, they want to fuck. Uh, they want to experiment with fucking each other in public. And uh, great job, you two. 
I'm so happy you got to uh, try that out. I'm glad you both had a great time. So uh, I finally launched a Facebook fan page for all you whores who have been uh, friending me on Facebook. That's very nice. It's very sweet of you. I appreciate it. But uh, I've decided I, I do need a personal space, kind of, you know, just a little bit, just just in case. You know, it's more like just in case I need it. I want to have it there. So uh, so go on over, uh, like my page, Billy Presida Comedian. All right. Uh, you can also go directly to it, facebook.com slash thebillyperceda. It'll be kind of like following me on Twitter, but on Facebook. You'll see jokes, you'll see pictures, you'll see podcast news, all that good stuff. You can message me there. Uh, If you are following me on Facebook, if you're following my Facebook profile, do go like the fan page because I am soon going to phase out and remove the following option so that that I have that profile for me. Football season is coming up, folks, and no, this is not an advertisement for... uh, for FanDuel or DraftKings or whatever. Last year, I did a fantasy football league just with me, uh, my roommate, and listeners of this podcast. So season two of the Fan Whore Fantasy Football League is coming up, and you can sign up. Uh, if you're interested in a $30 fantasy football league, uh, it's PPR league. We're going to draft uh, towards the end of the month or early September. Reserve your spot by emailing me at manwhorepod at gmail.com. I'm glad so many of you enjoyed the April Flores episode. That was really cool. Oh, like such a great show. And I love getting emails and tweets and messages about that. Uh, I, I don't know if y'all know that. I think y'all tend to overestimate how many people send emails or how many people send tweets. Oh, if, you, if you like something, say something. You know, we, we definitely love hearing from you. April and I very much enjoyed all the kind words you had to say about her episode, about her body positive, pee positive, finding love after a death message. So that was really cool. And you know what else is really cool? This week's episode. Oh, my God. This is another one from my Los Angeles trip. So I've been holding on to this episode for months. I almost want to apologize for not giving it to you sooner. But yes, I have on Janet Hardy and Dossie Easton. They are the co-authors of The Ethical Slut. On the cover of uh, the, the book, at least my copy, it says it's Dossie Easton and Catherine Lizt, but that's just the pen name of Janet Hardy. Uh, they were both in town in Los Angeles when I was there, so it was actually really cool. I had booked Janet Hardy because I knew she was going to be in LA when I was there, so... Uh, I'm in, we, we rented, I had to rent a, like a private study room at this like Korean tutoring slash study hall place. It was kind of weird. There was no air conditioning. It was really fucking hot. And so I'm, I'm waiting in this room and in comes Janet Hardy, but she says, I have a surprise for you. And I was like, do tell. And this tiny little lady. This tiny little old lady walks in behind her, and it's Dossie. She goes, Dossie. And I'm like, oh, my God. Ermager, Dossie. Ah, that was a pleasant surprise. So I want to apologize in advance for the audio quality. If they sound a little faint, they were sharing a microphone. I only brought two mics with me because I didn't know Dossie would be joining us. But uh, I think it comes through okay. This was a very cool episode. We obviously talk about the book we talk about polyamory bdsm and getting it on later on in your years oh this was a good one and i hope you all enjoy it i'm gonna shut my fucking face because some of you aren't here for me you might be here for them and that's uh very much justified so uh enjoy this episode with me dossie and janet just a bunch of ethical sluts talking about sexy stuff enjoy (laughs) <laughs> so um, uh, we were saying before that the you said the internet has like called like, caused like this resurgence with the popularity of the book of the, of the ethical slot. Well, really, of of all of our books, um, the internet has made it possible for people who don't fit into mainstream relationships or sexuality to find each other. So you know, it's not like people just invented polyamory in the right. last decade, um, but the people who aren't fond of monogamy had no real way to find each other up until the internet happened. Yeah. So we we rode that wave, and our book became a success beyond our expectations. Yeah. 
That's all. You say uh, polyamory has been around longer than there's even been the word. I'm reading this book about uh, Greenwich Village right now. Uh -huh. And apparently, like, you know, back in the 20s, they called it varietism. I was like, that's a cute little word there. That's a varietism. I, I kind of like that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Might have to steal that at some point. So uh, so this is a great time. I, this is a lovely surprise I have. Is uh, I'm here with uh, Janet Hardy and the surprise guest, Dossie Easton, of uh, the authors of The Ethical Slut. Yay. Hello, hello. <laughs> uh, thank you for coming out. <laughs> uh, so, so you you two are like mega superstars in like the sex pause world, right? I guess. I, yeah, I would assume. I, I guess we kind of are. Yeah. I feel like every sex positive person I've talked about like mentions like your your book is the first one that they bring up, and then there's all the you know other uh, kink books you, you two have written. It's just like the main thing. Yeah. And and what was that like difficult or did, what? How did that change things when you all were dating? Like when the book came out. Um. I don't think it, because we were already well on our own path by right. the time we, we wrote a book together. Um, the reason we wrote the, well, the, the, the impetus to write the book was actually we were teaching, um, a, a BDSM 101 class at Mensa, of all places, at a, a Mensa gathering. Hmm. Um, and, as we often do, we teach from our own experience. Yeah. Someone asked, uh, you guys talk about negotiating. Uh, can you de demonstrate that? Because I'm not sure what you mean when you talk. And so we pretended that we were a longtime couple who was going to do our first BDSM scene together. <laughs> and uh, that was all good. But uh, later that night, I, there was a hot tub gathering. And I ran into a friend of mine at the hot tub gathering. And she said, you should have heard the conversation in my hot tub. I said, okay, I'll buy the conversation in your hot tub. And she said, it was, did you hear about that SM talk this afternoon? There was two women doing it, and they were talking about stuff they had done together, and one of their boyfriends was right in the room. <laughs> Shocking. Shocking, And yes. what year, this is like in what? The 95, 95, 96. Yeah, because the, the first came, book, first edition of the book was in 97. Yeah. All right, okay. So it would have been about 95 that we started writing it. Okay, so that, and that was still crazy taboo then. Not, not Any, even taboo. It just yeah. wasn't talked about. It it was, uh, you know, the, you had to kind of already be poly to know the word polyamory. It was uh -huh. not well understood the way it is now, and there were there were not there there were poly munches in a few cities or gatherings of some kind in some of the major cities, but uh, not much. There was literally only one other contemporary book. Yeah, and what was what was that, that book? Was Love Without Limits Deborah. by Deborah Anna Pohl. Yeah. Okay. I went to um, the poly gathering in the in the Bay Area when we were first talking about writing it, just to kind of kind of find out what people were talking about, what they wanted to know, and so I announced that uh, I was working on a book. And during the break, the the guy who was kind of the honcho of the poly group took me aside and said, "Well, why write a book about polyamory? Das um, Deborah Annapol already wrote a book about polyamory." <laughs> it's such a it's specifically for Polly that's a funny question because like why is there gotta be only one? Why yeah, can't exactly. I have multiple partners in books? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and what I said was Deborah's written a wonderful book about one style of Polly, which is long term multi partner group marriage. Group marriage. Yeah. But we really want to address all the different ways that people can relate, um, including group sex and casual sex. And he said Oh, you mean tertiary relationships? Uh, you can't really see my eyes rolling on a podcast, but <laughs> you can imagine the eye roll here. Mm -hmm. Tertiary relationships, and I said, "No, I mean like the guy on the other side of the glory hole." Oh, <laughs> and, <God. laughs> and his mm -hmm. face kind of came all unglued, which I love to do. So that that was the world that we were entering when we began working on the book. And I think one of the things that made our writing kind of distinctive is we've always written in a very conversational tone. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of. Um, notions that if you write about sexuality, you have to write very, very carefully as if you were um, wearing a white witness. coat with a stethoscope around your neck and you uh, could only allow to use long multisyllabic words in dead languages. So <laughs> We were, we were just well. talking about this when you were out the yeah, room. <laughs> so just hence the title and the fact that we wrote in the same language that people talk to each other about sex in. Mm -hmm. So that that was how it should be. So people would talk more to each other about sex, please. Right. It's, it's funny you, you brought that up because before we were talking about how I have to do a comedy show tonight and I got told I have to do like 10 minutes clean material. And I was like, well, I mean, I could talk about orgies without cursing. I'm, I'm able to do that. Um, I can do those jokes. And I, but and I said like, well, if you add enough syllables, it ends up being a clean word because it's almost like they forget what you're talking about. Yeah, right. 
Like by the time you finish the words, like I forgot what this whole thing was about, but go for it. Yeah. <laughs> I, I love that about the book. This was the first book that I read that ever opened me up to any of this thinking. You know, you hear some things, you listen to some Dan Savage, but I never did. This was the first thing I read. And this, and it made me seem normal. It, it almost legitimized anything I had been thinking. We you know, a lot. yeah, yeah. It made me feel like I wasn't crazy, you know, because I think I was, uh, I was 22, mm -hmm. and I'm just mm -hmm. like, I don't know, am I doing this wrong? And no, y'all, it was great. Yeah, it's conversational tone, but it was, it was, tech, it was textbooky enough to like walk me through. Like I tell, I think everyone should have to read that chapter about jealousy, really? even if, even if they don't read the book. Yeah. Just that one chapter, like alone, is enough to really help, like, change someone's life. Well, yeah, I think it's really important because we have so much mythology around what jealousy is. And the chapter is really, really clear about how people can basically learn to manage jealousy, which the whole society teaches us is unmanageable. Yeah. So it's kind of miracle work. Yeah. No, we all grow up believing that we're expected to manage anger when we feel angry and yeah. or we're expected to manage sadness when we feel sad and yet jealousy somehow gets promoted to this utterly unmanageable status unlike any other emotion any human being has ever had yeah. which you know it's just absurd yeah. the, i was listening to you on um i think it was tristan's uh, like an old episode of tristan's podcast and uh -huh. you said this is very controversial book when it came out um, I was eight, so I don't. I was not familiar of the controversy at the time. Oh, we we did a couple of radio <laughs> interviews where we got called some names. I believe well, I believe cause of the fall of Western civilization. Yes, all was by that? ourselves. We, yeah, we, caught, we <laughs> caused the fall. undoing the fabric of civilization. Yes, yes that's us. <laughs> some say the Persians could do it, but you two, uh, you know, way more efficient. <laughs> you know the Gandhi quote about uh, someone asked him what he thought of Western civilization, and he said he thought it was a very good idea. <laughs> 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 So why were why was everyone freaking the fuck out? What was that? Um, I, I it took me a year or two uh, after we did we did a lot of morning drive radio, um, mm -hmm. and we would get these people who were really really angry. Yeah, and finally I sort of figured out that I put myself in their position. If I were say a fifty year old woman who had been monogamous all my life because I had always been told that was the only ethical way to leave my life, and hating it you know, miserable in it. And some broad came on the radio and said, no, you don't have to. You never had to. It works fine. The other. I would be freaking furious. And I would probably not be evolved enough to be furious about the people who had told me the wrong thing in the first place. So I would get mad at the woman on the radio. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and there's also the fact that, you know, when I speak, we, we write, we also write books about BDSM and, mm -hmm. um, if I'm speaking about SM, people don't give me anywhere near as hard a time yeah. as if I'm speaking about sluttery. And um, I think the reason is that people can say, oh, well, I'm not like one of those crazy leather people, mm -hmm. right? You know, I don't have any chains in my closet, maybe. Um, <laughs> but th they're all scared that a partner is cheating on them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that's a sort of universal paranoia that's out there and uh, created by the mythology that we have about jealousy. And so everybody is like, oh, my God, you know, people will cheat and they'll break, you know, it, it, the world will come to an end. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's just a fear of like the unknown, a fear of being, fear of being lied to, fear of not knowing what's going on, which mm -hmm, mm -hmm. extends to uh, the relationships. In a way, it's the fear of the loss of control, which you right. know, everybody is a little bit afraid of losing control. Um, and if if the rules change, then everything goes out of control for a while. And we who have been doing it for a long time can tell them that it will eventually get back to where it feels controllable. But in the beginning, yeah, it's, it can be scary and it can make people mad. Yeah. So how long? How long have you two? Where? How, where did you two meet? Like how? How's <laughs> we just just finished telling this story to somebody oh. else? <laughs> um, this goes back twenty five years now. Okay. Um, we were both living in the Bay Area, and we were both involved in the BDSM scene, Dossie, mm -hmm. for much longer than I had at that time. Mm -hmm. um, and a friend of ours was doing a, a program for one of the BDSM groups, and he called me up. I had seen Dossie at parties and stuff. I had seen her play. Um, he called me up and said, Dossie Easton is doing a program for us about pain play with canes from Psyche to Soma, and she's looking for a, a model for her demo. <laughs> you don't happen to know anybody who would be interested in that, do you? And so, of course, I was. Um, was part of you like the Dossie? Like, yes, yeah, kind of like that, like yes. Um, so while, while we were talking about what we were going to do in that workshop and negotiating our limits and so on, um, I put to her – a question that someone had put to me. I, at the time, I had started Greenery Press, and it was still tiny. Hmm. Um, but someone had asked me, 
you've you've done a really good book about how to be a top, and Jay's done another one. When is someone going to do a really good book about how to be a bottom? Ah. And my jaw dropped because it had never occurred to me that this was a book, and uh, immediately I knew it should be. And Dossie was the most famous bottom I knew, so I said, oh, <laughs> Dossie, would you like to write this book for me? And she said, you're, you're going to have to write it with me. And so that was kind of how we, we started. Oh, that's adorable. And that was about, yeah, <laughs> that's a awesome. quarter century ago. <laughs> yep. That's amazing. And how did you all even get into that this scene, this world? I mean, where, where do you all come from? Um, I actually dropped out of college and the mainstream culture when I was 18 after, this is so tacky, but after I met Tim Leary and Dick Alpert <laughs> when they were still at Harvard and decided to go be a psychedelic revolutionary. This was in 1962. And... Um, go move to Greenwich Village and um, get it on with everybody I could get my hands on. <laughs> and Because uh, I was also I at that it. time just really c questioning the sexual values I'd grown up with. I had this big fight. I now call it laundering dirty words. As why would these words be considered dirty that are about sex or even the ones that are about body parts or elimination? I don't care. Yeah. It's like why would we consider words to be bad? All right. Wait, so you were getting on in the village. Words Wait, tell me. Everybody does. Tell, tell me. Any Any big names? Kerouac, anyone good, anyone big like that? Did you get your hands on anyone I, I might have read? Well, this happened before. <laughs> Actually, the ah. first person who ever picked me up in a bar <gasps> uh, is someone that is well-known publicly. We were up doing something that college kids do that we probably shouldn't have been doing. We were dancing to Sonny Stitt in a bar in Harlem called Big Wilt Small's Paradise. And I was introduced to this man who was sitting in a chair in the corner, and we talked, and we decided to go home. And... Um, he stood up and he stood up and he stood up and he stood up. And here we were in Big Wilt's Small's Paradise, and suddenly the staff is saying, Good night, Mr. Chamberlain. Good night, Mr. Chamberlain. Oh, you're one Good of night, the Mr. Chamberlain. Chamberlain. Oh, he's a very sweet man. I mean, you're I can one, understand you're how one we got of the laid 1K? that much. <laughs> Oh, it's more than 1K, darling. <laughs> <laughs> I've got 1K at least. Darcy! Oh, that was the first person I ever picked up in a bar. <laughs> I was 18 years old. <laughs> the like, Wilt! I have to admit, it was a little bit downhill. Did you know? Who, did you, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're you peeking, peeking a little early with a uh, with a Hall of Famer. <laughs> Wait, did um, you know? But did you know who but, he was? Like, yeah, did you yeah, know who? I, I, well, of course, he was way too. I'm not like I don't follow sports, but he was way too famous for me not to know who right. he was. Yeah, and he was also seven foot one, and he weighed two hundred and seventy five pounds and had a thirty one inch waistline. I mean, he was a gorgeous man and really remarkable. <laughs> um, he was twenty six at the time, and I was eighteen. Okay. Okay. I don't have any stories nearly. I was gonna, I was gonna, I was gonna say, you got any celebrity things <laughs> no, that you feel comfortable no, sharing? No celebrity. I, I once slept with someone who had been turned out into B. Actually, I was with her for a long time. Turned out into BDSM by, oh, one of the rock gods, and I can't now remember <laughs> which one. But <laughs> I mean, I slept with someone who's been like a background extra. That's all I got. Yeah. That's all I got. <laughs> I, I gave birth to one of those who's a, bank, <laughs> a background extra. <laughs> Oh, that's awesome. So, and so where you, so you, where you come in, into this world from the village, that makes sense to me. Um, I'm a big fan of the village. That's where I want to end up. I feel like mm -hmm. that's where I belong. Yeah, I started you know? out as a beatnik. Mm -hmm. That's, that's the chapter I just started today while I was having lunch. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, uh, and where, where do you, where do you thrive from? Nothing that exciting. I, I went to school at UC Santa Cruz. Anything, any story that ends with this haircut is exciting to me. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> $12 in Eugene. Um, <laughs> I went to school at UC Santa Cruz back mm. in the early 70s. And, you know, UC Santa Cruz is still kind of a hotbed, and certainly in the early 70s it was. And so I was happily slutting around with different people and um, doing some experimental play. Uh, the first night I spent with my the, the guy who turned out to be my husband, that is kind of a good story, actually. <laughs> um, I wanted to get an IUD because I was having trouble on the pill, and I was back in the Dalcon Shield days. But what's, what's that? Oh, it was a. I'm, I'm first, twelve. I don't know anything. Yeah, I'll, <laughs> an IUD that was actually very dangerous to the people who used it. it oh, was not okay. A safe device. Yeah, there there was a big class action suit later on that I made two hundred dollars off of. People got hurt. Yeah. Oh, okay. But I I wanted to have one inserted, and there was only one doctor in town that would do IUDs on unmarried women. And so I had an appointment with him, but they made it clear that I needed someone to drive me home afterwards. The only person I knew who had a car was my best friend, Kat, who was at Stanford. So I called her up and asked if she would come stay the night and drive me to my doctor's appointment the next day. And she said, um, sure, but you have to get me someone to fuck. I'm not coming unless you can find me someone to fuck. 
And I looked down my mental Rolodex, and the only person I could really ask to fuck her so I could get my IUD was my boyfriend. So I went to him and said, hey, would you please fuck Kat so that I can get a ride to the that's, doctor tomorrow? That's quite the deal to make. It, it was. It was. I'm still friends with all of these people. <laughs> um, and he thought that was cool. Uh, so there, they, we had dinner together. They went wandering off toward his dorm, dorm room, which left me kind of bereft. I had nobody to take care of me this night before I was going to have sure. this difficult procedure. So there was this guy that I was part of a bridge foursome with of all the weird places to start a relationship. <laughs> um, but we'd been playing bridge with two other people for a while. And I went and found him and said, you know, Barry is off fucking cat and I don't have anybody to sleep with. Will you come sleep with me? <laughs> um, that led to a 15 year marriage and two children. Mm. Uh, so um, we later, a uh, very Santa Cruz story. I had found a room off campus that I liked, but it was too expensive for me to get by myself. And it was a large room. Um, so I called him up and said, I got this room. Do you want to share it with me? We could put a curtain down the middle and have separate mattresses. The first night we were there, um, I had not yet acquired a mattress for myself. So I shared his mattress and. Oh, how convenient. Yeah, you're right. How convenient, Janet. <laughs> I just didn't happen to get the mattress. I see what didn't, you did. I didn't get the mattress. I see what you did and there. So somehow from there, they had two children. Yes. Yeah. That's just, uh, that's how, <laughs> that's how it works. So that was kind of the way things worked at Santa Cruz back <laughs> then is, you know, you sort of tumbled into whatever was there to tumble into. And so I did. Okay. Um, uh, but from there, it gets a lot more boring. Uh, we well, were married for 15 years in as a hetero monogamous couple. Mm -hmm. Had two marvelous sons, uh, one of whom I'm staying with here in L.A. Mm -hmm. um, later in the relationship, I realized that I was not the only person in the world who got turned on thinking about spanking, which was a sort of epiphany back then when I didn't have access to the, any sex information. Right. Um, and we kind of we, we couldn't work that one out. We experimented and it turned me on a lot and it didn't turn him at all on at all so we came apart mm -hmm. over, over that we remained friends this is before you knew about like poly or anything I'm like sorry. that no problem don't worry about it. hi sweetie what's the what's the verdict i am so proud to say that the man whore podcast is funded primarily by you my listeners on patreon sure a lot of shows have you know advertisers and sell merch and have lucrative nike commercial deals but no I'd rather have the money come directly from you. What that says to me is that, hey, Billy, we value you. We value what you do. And we love you for it. And uh, I, I fucking love you back. So every week, I like to thank all the patrons individually uh, in the impersonal Patreon. Thank you, Roll Call. Yes. So right now, here's a big thank you to Jennifer C., Lance, SB, Madeline B, Jeff C, Jazz O, Dave K, Justin C, Nelly H, Ramon F, Sarah B, Sarah S, Lauren A, Prickly Peach, Lawrence B, Jeffrey J, Holly F, Christina D, Nicole M, Jessica K, Michael P, Millie W, Brian W, Frank D, Jeremy B, and still more names to go. Danielle, DP, Andrew R, Megs N, Charles G, Derek N, Sarah M, Carrie W, Catherine B, Alex S, Chris W. A lot of W's in the house. Lauren M, Chris with a K, Gregory Y, Anna, super slut. Ed B, Sean B, Sean N, Corey G, Scott B, CJK, Steve Dean from dateworking.com. Ashley J, Alfredo A, Mark G, Emily S, almost there, Toby T, Anthony C, Greg A, Ben B, and Jeffrey Z. Thank you all so much for your generous pledges, and you too can join over 50 fan whores by supporting the Man Whore Podcast on Patreon. You can pledge as little as a dollar per month, and you can cancel at any time. To do so, go to manwhorepod.com and click the Patreon banner on the side. Or you can download the Patreon app and find me on there. That's Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N. Now let's get back to the ethical sluts. But so, so all that uh, stuff with your, your ex-husband, that was before you knew about Polly and, yeah. and that that could have maybe been an option. Yeah, there's a very real sense in which I wrote Polly, uh, wrote Ethical Slut, um, or co-wrote Ethical Slut, to save the marriage that I could have had. Okay. Um, I think if we had had some guidance about Polly and some role models, mm -hmm. we might still be together. Um, that, I'm not sure that would necessarily be a good thing, but 
it, it would have been a very different story. Yeah. Sometimes I wonder, because we were both science fiction readers at the time, but we didn't know that there was a community of science fiction things that we could go to. If we had found that community, that we would have found out about Polly there. Okay. Are, are, are the sci-fi people super Polly? Yeah. yeah. Because I, I, I've always assumed like nerds are just nerds are the kinky ones. That's why I figured out. Nerds are kinky. Nerds, nerds are pretty are kinky. Nerd, nerds are poly as They're, well. Comic books, a lot of ropes. Heinlein <laughs> has probably created as many poly people as we have through the years. <laughs> yeah, and my my transformation came. I kept thinking that I would um, grow up and settle down. Right. Ha. -ha. Um, and St still waiting. I tried so. a few. T I had about three tries at that, and the third time it ended pretty disastrously. But I had. I came out of that with something real valuable, my baby, my child. Mm -hmm. And uh, when she was about three months old, I um, took a thousand mics of acid and had an amazing transformative trip. It was also the culmination of seven years of exploring psychedelics and spirituality. So it's not like there wasn't right. a foundation for this. And in that, and when I came back to to ground after this amazing adventure um, in my brain. Um, or the cosmos, whichever you think that is. Sure. And, uh, I realized that I, it was my nature to be a slut and I was never going to be monogamous again. Mm -hmm. And I vowed I wouldn't. And I started thinking about how's this going to work? And this was in 1969. Mm -hmm. And there were a lot of people who were playing around. It wasn't like that didn't exist. But that was, was the time for but it. But it was also, there wasn't, there weren't some things I needed. I had a kid. I was thinking, okay. Um, I think what's missing in some of this is what I want my relationships to be uh, is not committed to how long they last, but I want them to be affectionate. Mm. I want them to be about um, caring about each other and sharing intimacy. So what, how can I do that? And how I can do that is maybe uh, somebody once told me that I good mouth. Um, but uh, maybe I need to tell people how much I appreciate them instead of doing this sort of singles bar thing where you look at somebody in the morning and go, mm, well, if I don't want to marry them, I can't ever see them again, and it's all too embarrassing, you know. Yeah. But rather to say, oh, that was really nice, you know. We I should really do it like again. You. Yeah, yeah, right. And uh, <laughs> and that led me into a very marvelous world of, um, and I, I discovered the science fiction writers and the the uh, Society for Creative Anachronism and a bunch of people who already had these very big extensive families. And because I had a child, a baby, I think I was very lucky uh, in that everything I did had to have some aspect of sustain sustainability to it. I could do one night stands. That yeah. didn't affect the child. But I couldn't bring speed freaks home. I couldn't have things go bad in my environment. Uh, and the people who stayed needed to be comfortable with small children. That was it, period. I mean, you know, and so she wound up in a wonderful, we lived communally for a long time. It was great. There were always plenty of adults. There were always other little kids, other people's little kids to be sisters and brothers. It was good stuff. Yeah, y'all talk about that a little bit in the, in the ethical slut, right? It's yeah. been a few years since I read it, but it's... Uh... There's a lot of talk about like uh, communal raising and, and whatnot. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think that's one of the things that slut uh, that poly in general has to offer. I think in a lot of ways, what the poly community is doing is remaking the extended families in which humans lived for most of right. human human life, where you, you have uncles and cousins and aunts and grandparents and younger siblings and older siblings all living together and meeting each other's needs and making sure the essentials get taken taken care of. Now that we all live at some distance, either geographic or emotional, from our families of origin, that doesn't mean that suddenly we're going to turn into people who like to live as nuclear families. I don't think we are. I don't think nuclear families fit very well for most people. Right. So what Polly does is we found a, a way of building tribe a different way. Instead mm -hmm. of instead of based on our DNA, and, uh, we're we're basing it on different kinds of connections. Okay. Okay. And, and now now that uh, y'all are of uh, of certain ages, if if that's appropriate very to say, <laughs> very, very, very certain. certain. Yes. I am uh, 72. 72. Uh, and 61. And I, and I, I've also, I've talked to Betty Dodson, who's, uh, she's like, I think like 86. 86. Yeah. She's, she would be about 86 now. Yep. That sounds yep. about right. I, you after. And she go way back. Yeah. She's do, 14. Yeah. Do you I, too? I knew her from a long time ago. <laughs> yeah. 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 Oh, do tell. Well, what? she was, she had, um, she was living between New York and San Francisco back in the early, early to mid seventies. Okay. She had a commune, very famous commune, the Dodson commune <laughs> up, um, off of Castro and 19th street. And it was this big kind of open space. They took out all the doors. They took out all the big furniture. And you would go up there, and there would be this huge loft 
with a deck outside and some people would be sunbathing naked and some people would be making juice and some people would be playing chess and some people would be fucking in the corner and somebody else would <laughs> be just, jacking wait, off. You were just like, someone's playing chess and someone's fucking over that. Like, yeah. Just, <laughs> yeah, right. That, that's exactly the way it is <laughs> and places like that. That was what they, they were deliberately, the Dodson commune, I didn't live there, but I, I wound up partnering with one of the members of the commune, so it was family to me. And um, it, we... You know, we were looking at, uh, in particular, normalizing sex. Right. And being very, being able to be quite matter of fact about it instead of going, oh, somebody's fucking in the corner where, oh, look, nice. Well, somebody's fucking in the corner. Yeah. You know, it's, uh, it's a sunny day and, and there's lovely. fresh juice to drink and someone's fucking in the corner. Yeah, yeah. right. <laughs> it's like a normal part of life. Yeah. Isn't that nice? A normal part of life. And then somewhere in the 80s, that all got lost, it seems. I don't know. <laughs> it, you know the, the Reagan era was not kind to sexuality, I think it would be safe yeah. to say. Yeah, there was – well, the, we thought we were going to lose the communities to AIDS, actually. Yeah. That was really scary. Mm -hmm. But, um, in fact, the institution stayed. The play parties stayed. The party houses stayed. The – uh, the communities of sluts, sluts stayed, and many things, pers you know, kept going. Radical fairies stayed. Was there a shift in in the way uh, in like safety at parties? Because now, if I go to a play party, super like su huge emphasis on safety. There's a when you check your coach, you got to listen to a quick talk about um, safe for sex practices and and consent. Was there a shift at some point when that happened? I'm glad to hear that. Well, I was already a sex educator through San Francisco Sex Ed information which i started out with in 73 i mm. taught my first chat class on unlearning jealousy in 1973 mm. so when the 80s rolled around i was i and some gay men friends of mine i was living communally with gay men um and they were raising my daughter with me and we were do we started doing safe safer sex classes around 82 83 um, and even that early in the epidemic, like I remember being at Stanford and seeing all these young guys who had come to our safer sex, sex class at the student union at Stanford, and they were looking at my friends David and Clark, both of whom are gone by now, um, and it was like they didn't, these were young guys who were coming out and there were no elders. Yeah. All their elders were sick. And it was uh, another, it was another development. The gay community actually, went to work and made institutions. I'm very proud to know Rick Crane, who was one of the founders of the San Francisco AIDS um, Foundation, mm. because it was the we started making our own charities, our own social services, because we didn't trust anybody else to. Yeah. And uh, we, we lobbied with the medical agencies. We made a huge difference in how research was done. Because um, they were using people as non really non-consensual guinea pigs. Mm -hmm. The idea of informed consent became very important then. And so there was a lot of development of the gay community, and it became more public. I'll never forget the day I went to the supermarket to buy food because one of our housemates had died, <coughs> and we were doing a funeral. And um, on the cover of Time magazine, Newsweek, and Life magazine were gay couples. Mm -hmm. And it was all about the terrible ep epidemic. But nowhere had you ever seen straight media paying so much attention to queer people. Yeah. So, so there was a reaction where, like, people were like, "We're going to use, we're going to start using condoms now." Probably, like, that yeah. seems like a better idea now. I, I remember very because during the era when Dossie was doing this hard work in San Francisco, I was still in Sacramento. It was shortly after the marriage had ended, and I was being single for the first time since college. And I remember very clearly getting it that just because at the time I was straight um, did not mean that I got a free pass on right. the condom thing. Yeah. Uh, up until then, yeah, I'd been I, what we would now call barebacking, but it was it became clear around then that just because you like to fuck someone who had an innie instead of an Audi didn't mean that you got off scot-free right. on, on that. Um, and that would have been around 1988 mm -hmm. that, that mm -hmm. I was doing that. All right. So, so yeah, so as I was saying before, like, uh, of being of, are you all two still active, still sexually active? Do you, yeah. or kink I not, active? I am not right now. Dossie <coughs> is. Dossie still is. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so, um, I've heard you talk about this on other podcasts before. What's, 
what's your current state? Like what, as, as the kids would say, like, what's your deal? What's my deal? <laughs> what's my dealio, man? Um, I am married to a fellow genderqueer bisexual. Mm-hmm. Um, We've been uh, our marriage. We just celebrated our tenth anniversary, if you can believe that, of, of our marriage. And Mazel. We were together. Thank you. We were together as a couple for a couple of years before that, uh, for a variety of reasons, which I can talk about if you want. We do not have what most people would think of as sex, mm. um, and um, it seems fine. Neither of us seems to miss that much. We, we, we still do a lot of affectionate touch. Uh, and things of that nature, which I, I don't think I would be willing to give that up. Mm. Um, but I'm not feeling... A lot of hugs. A You're a big of, hugger? A lot of hugs, I love hugging. Yeah. Hugs good. Hugs are so good. Everyone should have more of those. It's true. <laughs> hugging and cu- kissing and cuddling, all of that still. Um, but uh, as one of my gay men friends, he says... I don't do, I'll do anything but put tab A into slot B. Um, and so we do not put tab A into slot B. Mm. Um, but during the time that Dossie and I were researching radical ecstasy, um, I learned to um, bring myself to a tantric orgasm at will. Okay. And there was a while in there when I was having them without volition, which was not pleasant. And just the people who aren't aware, what is what does that mean? What is that? It's a way of... Breathing and moving and visualizing that you pull energy up f- from the ground or up from your genitals and make it run around your body so that you have um, an energy wave that feels right. orgasmic. Um, these days I do it mostly through ecstatic dance, which has become my thing. Okay. Um, but I don't seem to need genital sex much anymore. Uh, and that's undoubtedly partly my age. Um but here's Dossie, still right. 11 years older than me and still trucking along just fine with genital sex. Right. So um, yeah. it, it's not it's not exclusively my age. It, it kind of feels like I set out many years ago on a journey to discover what was at the end of sexual ecstasy. And I kind of got there. Yeah. And now I, I don't feel so much like I need to do that journey anymore. Okay. And and Dossie, so at, at 72, what, what's your sex life like? Well... I'm single right now. I, okay. I uh, broke. I've been single for about the past five years and right. broke off a relationship where I am now the fairy grandmother to my ex partner's two year old son. All right. And my ex partner is planning to inseminate again and have another one. So I will be probably fairy grandmother to that child too. I would say that my sex life is less frequent than it used to be, mm-hmm. but that's partly because I live out in the country and I'm very busy. And you know, being Tinder's a really hard when you're in the country. Not as many people nearby. I understand. Yeah, the so there's a real. lot of driving, and but when I do get together with people, it's spectacular and wonderful and great. Okay. And uh, met a lovely new person last night. And, you know, it's all good. Last night? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I go all kinds of places to teach, and I meet people, and it's always, you know, there's a lot of adrenaline running, so it's always yeah. fun. When, when you're traveling as a sex educator, the whole the old thing about, like, sailors having a sweetheart in right. every port, it, it's kind of like that. Yeah. There, there's people in every city that you look forward to seeing again. People always and the ju- English woman I met in Australia is flying out in two weeks. Hey. Yes. Tell her I said hello. Yes. And, um, Tell her I said hello. This sounds exciting. And I got um. another person flying into Imsel. <laughs> Um, and so my Dossie, life is like, you have, you this have, month is going to be actually you unusually got more busy for me. partners than like people I know who are listening to the show right now. This is oh, undoubtedly. Killing it. Uh, but, How do you get to Carnegie Hall? Right? And I, I don't have, in th- terms of my... Doesn't she run Carnegie Hall then at this point? <laughs> it, it, um, it, at my age, but I, I didn't before. See, I never had a need for a certain quantity of sex. That right. sounds kind of funny, but I never have had a strong need for bread and butter sex. I like production numbers. Okay. So if I do it infrequently, but when I do do it, it takes a few hours, then I'm a happy camper. All right. That's my ideal That's right. regularity. <laughs> and so, um, and since we do SM, we do lots of stuff that is not necessarily genital, but it's still sex, right. um, and tantra. And so it, it seems I'm very happy and these people are my support. And one of the things I want to say is under underground, I back in 69, I said, I'm not going to take my security from my partnered relationship. I'm going to take my security from my community. Mm-hmm. That's where my, I will be sure my support comes from. Last year, my spine collapsed and I had a huge spine surgery. I was in hospitals for a month. I was long, long recovery. The first two weeks I was in a hospital, an ex-lover of mine, who has a history, who does a lot of hospice work, and my daughter, who is now 47, slept every other night in my hospital room because I was 
had had so much surgery and so much anesthesia and was in so much pain, I was functionally not sane. Mm. And they decided I should not be left alone. Other people came, a couple of other people spent the night, other people came and helped out and spelled them. I was in hospital another two weeks after that. People brought food, people took care of me. Then I went and spent a month living in the guest room uh, in San Francisco so, so I wouldn't have to drive and deal with stairs at my house. Mm. Uh, where I, lover, yes. with somebody I broke up with in 1979. Yeah. An army of exes cannot An fail. An army of exes. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it, it, to me, it's family. It's like this gigantic family. Right. And if I need more intimacy, I start calling people on the phone and inviting them out or going and visiting them. And if I have too much, I go out into my little hermitage and wander about in the woods and talk to the critters. Yeah. And the flowers blooming. That's beautiful. That's awesome. I love that. <laughs> Uh, so, so you also have written uh, a bunch of books. So you've got a, a book coming out. Um, well, you uh, just booked a book just came out, Spanking yeah, for month. Lovers, right? Spanking for Lovers, yeah. Um, many years ago, I did a book called The Complete Spanker, and this is an updated. Uh, actually, it's an updated version. So of it it, w- it was the incomplete spanker. I, I, <laughs> I didn't know it at the time. But yes, apparently it was. Um, I, I did a second book called The Toy Bag Guide to Canes and Caning. So this book um, includes material from both of those books plus some new stuff. Okay. So it's it's a basic it, it's a how to book for anybody who wants to explore spanking in an adult relationship. D- does the does the kink factor have to tone down a bit like with the age? Like can you can you not take as big of a spank as like maybe you were when you were 30? Like um certainly the, the intensity of of play can change, but some young people can't either. Yeah, right. Many people have physical conditions sure. that you have to accommodate. So if I were to take a spanking now, um, I've got a bad hip that I would have to be paying some attention to, mm. and I would have to be careful about my position because I've got some lumbar vertebrae that are not happy campers. Um, but I could once I got those things taken care of, my skin still works fine, my nerves still work fine. Right. So it's yeah, and I find that um, having recovered from the surgery, I'm amazed at how much mo- movement I have. I can dance and such like. But having recovered from the surgery, my skin's a little thinner than it used to be. But the biggest difference is I don't have the stamina I used to have. And after about three hours, I start getting tired. After about three hours. <laughs> poor, poor baby. <laughs> right? Well, I thought it was going to, after the surgery, I thought it was going to be a lot less than that. Yeah, to sure. tell you the truth, I'm very grateful to find that I have as much left as I have. Yep. Fair I enough. mean, so if someone, someone listening to this show right now, they're, they're, be, they're getting on in years, they're getting older. What are some tips? What are some sex tips you got for some older folk? Don't give up. Don't give up. Yeah. Um, your body will not work in exactly the same way as it did when you were 20. Um, but you know so much more and you're, there, there are accommodations that can be made. Uh, the body parts may not function. You know, if you're female, you may need some help with lubrication. If you are male, you may not be able to get as erect, but there are so many other things to do together that, um, you don't need those things. Mm. Th- those are not necessary. If, if one part doesn't work, use a different one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what, what about like positions? Are there like, so, like, or, or where does someone even figure out? I mean, do you ask a doctor which positions you can be in? I mean, C- certainly having a doctor that you can ask questions like that is a very good thing to mm-hmm. do. Um, not all doctors will be able to accommodate that. But uh, I just had a, at the spe- spanking demo I gave last week, I had a young woman come up and ask because she too has problems with her lumbar spine. And I was telling her some things she could do to not jolt those those vertebrae that don't want to be jolted, but still get spanked the way she wants. Um, and that's a great thing to be able to ask your doctor, but not all not doctors, all doctors are. are uh... right. um, <laughs> there are books. Uh, there are certainly many internet groups where you can talk to other people, um, including older people who have similar issues and find out how they've accommodated them. Mm-hmm. Um And I am very pleased that before all this surgery happened, I had built my bondage bed. And one of the reasons you build things that (laughs) allow things to hang from the ceiling so is if you can't hold your leg up by yourself, but by God, you can just get some support for it. Yep. (laughs) Works just fine. We we are tool-using apes. And when when you're trying to have an active sex life into into midlife and beyond, then the tool-using part can come in really. Was there any time that like where the sex drive kind of went down or or when menopause is? is I'm asking this like I have no idea. Yeah. Um, as, as dumb man is, boy, like menopause is a bit of a crapshoot with that. I did yeah. menopause at 38 oh. and developed very high testosterone. <coughs> 
during which time, so I spent my 40s in absolute bliss. Of, I was more sexually active in my 40s than I had been any time in my life. So when you go through menopause, since, you can get more? Again. Yeah. <laughs> when you go through menopause, you get more horny? or Well, some, you some can. Do, some do. It's different uh, from different people. Uh, my testosterone went so far up that the, the lab people were making jokes and thought that I would look very butch, but I'm not. I'm femme. Yeah. But the... Um, what happened is the access to sexual desire got me very uninhibited for me, and so I was just easily found my turn on. Yeah, I had spent otherwise previously had spent all kinds of time hunting for my turn on. The foreplay's got to be just like so, and a lot of fussing about it. And um, then there it was, poop. Oh, turn on, look. And eventually, I developed that as a skill, mm. so it became easy. Uh, whereas I, who am butch, tend to run a little low on testosterone and, and I'm taking some supplements in order to keep my libido where I like it to be. Okay. Um, so it, it just... What kind of supplements are those? Um, I have a cream that I get at a compounding pharmacy uh, that I rub in every day. Okay. Just like factual. Yeah. I don't I don't yeah. know things. Testosterone cream? Testosterone cream, yeah. Uh-huh. Okay. Interesting. Uh, and so, so you're still writing and, and, and putting out books, uh, very prolific. And, and what, what are you doing now? Well, I'm a psychotherapist in private practice and okay. I get to, I'm training interns, uh, also to serve our communities. I serve my communities. You have to understand that, um, Slut lifestyles, SM lifestyles, uh, open sexual lifestyles, sex work, all of these things are very controversial. So then, if you are a person in any of these lifestyles, or genderqueer, mm-hmm. and you want a therapist, where do you go? Right. Nobody teaches this in graduate school. Where do you go? So I teach courses and I train uh, people who are interning, who are preparing to get licensed as therapists, and I have my own private practice. I'm also writing, I've got some articles and, and some poetry published, and I'm working on both the book and my memoirs, but the book is, take, is going to take forever. Mm. Yeah. I guess I'll, I'll end with this is, uh, you know, y'all do a lot of talking and speaking still on, on sex and kink and whatnot, and I'm sure colleges are involved in that. So how do you feel when you see this new batch of people come into your lectures and your workshops and whatnot? I, I am loving the millennial generation, by and large. Um, that that sentence is like rarely said. I don't even say well, it. Well, <laughs> fr- fr- from a sexual viewpoint, I, th- I have some issues with them in other directions. But all I wanted all along was for everybody to have all their sexual options laid out like a buffet and have them pick what looks good to them that day and try it on. And if it feels good, keep doing it. And if it doesn't, put it back and let someone else try mm-hmm. it. Um they're being much freer to be playful and experimental with gender and with sex than we ever were and than our kids ever were. Um, something like half of high school students now identify as other than straight. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it's just a remarkable shift. When I do poly sp- speeches on college campuses these, these days, it is frequent that several of the students in my audience are second or in one case even third generation poly. So these kids who grew up in a poly household with poly values, how are they going to build their lives when they don't have to spend all the time and energy we did in unlearning the Ward and June yeah. crap that we were fed? Uh, it's it's kind of miraculous to me. Yeah. And what I also find is I'm very inspired by the younger people who grew up because I may have been part of the early generations of feminism, queer liberation, and all this kind of thing, but it was young people who started using the word queer again, Mm -hmm. and um, which I love. It makes me very happy because I like it that it's open and it's not specific. Uh, But also, I am amazed by the young people because growing up in their power, Young queer people who never for a minute thought they were sick. Women, young women who never for a minute thought they shouldn't have power or careers or money of their own. Um, They are going to go places that I will never get to because they start on a foundation. I can take some credit of being an old timer who was one of the people who contributed toward changing the world and making it open so that they could be who they are, but they start so far ahead of where I started. I had to unlearn so much. I had to figure out the courage to try to be powerful. Where would I find it? Uh, you know, the, these people are amazing. I love watching them do their thing. I just love it. Like the Aesop's fable about the sparrow who flies up on the eagle's back and then takes off from there. They get to go places we just couldn't because we had to spend too much time unlearning. 
Some of my clients seem so brave to me. Yeah. They're going <laughs> to insist on being out of the closet because why would they go to a graduate school that wouldn't accept them yeah. as they are, including the fact that they're going to fund it by being a sex worker? Yeah. Stop it. You're going to make me cry. Uh, <laughs> that was that was beautiful. That was beautiful words. Um, where, where can people find you now? I thank you so much for doing this show, and thank you for bringing her along. Oh, what, that sure. Was, Oh. It's it's the day hasn't gone the way we started it, but it's, you, you it's make, been a good one. Yeah. You make a man who are quite uh, happy with such <laughs> of a surprise. Um, <laughs> which, by the way, um, the book, just that whole opening, redefining terms slut to be any gender yeah. was huge for me because right because I'm not like a bang bus bro, you know, yeah. like I'm not this dude trying to like quote slay bitches, you know, yeah. and and so what it fucks. Phrase. I know. <laughs> I don't understand it. I don't understand it. I don't understand their outfits. Um, <laughs> why are we popping collars? No, it's, but for since I wasn't that dude, yeah. And I was taught like if you're not that dude, uh, you know, you're either just like a guy who dates women very traditionally. So I'm like, the, the fu- what the fuck am I? And then I read this book. I'm like, oh, I can be. I can be a slut, and that is fine. And it doesn't mean like I'm some dude trying to exploit or like uh, conquest. I, I can just be someone who enjoys sex. Dossie and I have both spent a lot of our lives among gay men. Mm-hmm. And among gay men, slut is well, a term of affection. Uh, and so that that's where we picked that up from, I, I think. Yeah. I remember one sl- straight guy who said, you can't call it the ethical slut because men won't read it. And I said, well, I got that word from men. And he said, what? And he questioned that. Yeah. And I said, well, they were gay men. He said, yeah. well, they count. No, they don't count. <laughs> like, and I said, well, you have a lot of lovers. What do you call yourself? And he said, I call myself a stud. Uh, I, I never said, wanted to call myself that. How is that different from a slut? It has a penis. That's how it's different. Oh, I'm so silly about get, these yeah, things. Well, you it's, know? It's, it's different. <laughs> studs studs get paid more. That's uh, that's ah, in, yes, this, okay. in this country still. Uh, <laughs> I thought that was only if they were racehorses. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, so it was, it, the book was super important to me. I'm so I have to say because my friend would yell at me if not. She was the, she was the second episode of the show, so she would be oh, mad okay. at me well, if we I did. don't want her to be mad. <laughs> but but Jay is the one. If y'all remember episode two, um, uh, Jay. The the beat uh, <laughs> the one that she tried she told me I was uh, not a very good sub we that was my one foray of attempting neither am I it's was, all right yeah <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and she was the one who opened me up we went on some dates and I saw this book in her bedroom I'm like what's this yeah. this quite the title uh, and she tells tells me about it and I was like mm, I'm gonna read that one day and uh, I remember I picked it up and read it and I texted she was the first person I let know and she uh, she was she freaked out when I told her I was just talking to Janet she's gonna faint when I say it was both of you. <laughs> I, I will tell you that um, we just got our our uh, sales reports from our publisher. Mm-hmm. The book is inching up very quickly toward 200,000 copies in print. Nice. Um, when I was publishing it, I never spent a dime on advertising. Now that Random House is publishing it, they have never spent a dime on advertising. All of that has just been word of mouth, just mm-hmm. like you, you with your friend. Someone sees it in someone's house or someone gives it to a lover. and it's, it's Or a confused built- guy just passes it on a bookshelf in a store and did not read inside oh, first. <laughs> I, I have worked many tables at many shows and watched people come to a screeching halt looking at the book. And usually it's two women together and one of them stops and squeals, that's me. And then, then I can sell the books. <laughs> and the other one glares. You know? Well, anyway. Uh, well, thank you so much for doing the show. And, and so where where can people find both of you? So uh, Janet. Uh, my, uh, I have an author site at uh, JanetWHardy.com. Okay. And I'm at DossieEaston.com. All right, y- y'all, y'all don't do the Twitters, not not on that bandwagon. I, no. I, I, I do have an account. I don't use yeah. it much, but no, it's also no. it's also Janet W. Hardy. Yeah. Uh, this is phenomenal. I can't wait to see what the two of you uh, keep putting out there. Uh, thank you for doing what you did, oh, you're very and thanks welcome. for whatever for else you continue to do. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Uh, I want you to say goodbye to everybody. Say goodbye to all the sluts. Goodbye, sluts. Goodbye, sluts. Sweet dreams. <laughs> Bye, sluts. Wilt Chamberlain? What? The Wilt? She fucked one of the best basketball players of all time. That's legendary. <laughs> I was uh, I was honored to have these women on the podcast. Oh, I, I was just I fangirled the entire time. It was uh, I, I did my best to keep my composure, and I hope you all enjoyed it. And uh, if you did, let me know. Uh, I'm on Twitter at the Billy Presida. Say hello. Use the hashtag Manwhore Podcast. Let me know what you thought about the show. And if you have a few more words to say that don't fit in 140 characters, 
You can send me your comments, your questions, and your booby pictures over to manhorpod at gmail.com. Join the conversation with your fellow fan whores on the Man Whore Podcast subreddit. There are individual comment threads for every episode. Sometimes I also like to post pictures and um, exclusive news updates. Sometimes just ask for your opinion. For all you Reddit folk, that's r slash Podcast. And I also want to remind you that the Man Whore Podcast is sponsored by Clonawilly.com. Clonawilly allows you to make a vibrating molding dildo out of a real penis. And they are giving you 20% off just for listening to this podcast. So uh, go over to Clonawilly.com and use promo code MANHOR for 20% off your order. That code expires on August 10th. So it's a limited time offer. Again, Clonawilly.com. Promo code MANHOR. Uh, like me on Facebook. Leave a rating and review on iTunes. Enjoy yourselves. Have a great weekend. And stay slutty. Stay slutty.